Well, hi there, and welcome to our study on prayers and promises in the Bible on the Lighthouse Discord server. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter how many or how few there may be in the study this moment, no matter whether we're students, whether we're at work, whether we're home, whatever the circumstances are, Lord, you see it all. And we give you praise and glory and honor because each and every day in your presence is a beautiful day because you are the epitome of beauty. You are our amazing God. You deserve all our praise, all our glory, all our honor. And so as we're studying prayers of praise, I ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the words that you have for us in your word and that we would offer to you all of our praise, all of our thanks, and that it would be a fragrant offering of blessing to you this day. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So our first prayer today is this one. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O God, and you are exalted as head over all. Excuse me. Now, David had hoped to build a great temple to God, but God did not allow it. We read about that in First Chronicles 22, verses 6 to 10. David had been a man of war for too long. God did many things through David and had received many an offering of thanks from him. But that particular offering the offering of a beautiful temple would be for someone without blood on his hands. And David was disappointed, but he learned that even though he wouldn't be allowed to build the temple, his son Solomon would be, and that was the next best thing. So he began gathering materials against the day when Solomon would start building. Then he led the people in a prayer dedicating the generous offerings they had given. And we just read it. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth as yours. David's declaration of praise is an example to anyone wanting to extend an offering of love to God. David openly prays from his heart without reservation or fear. It's almost as if he will burst if the praises don't rise from the very depths of his soul and spill from his mouth. There's a sense of shouting here, as though he had rushed to the top of the very mountain, looked out over the lush hills, and valleys of Israel and declared the eternal truths of God's awesomeness. And the truth of it is that David was drawing some of his last breath. He was old and feeble. He had seen the better part of his life and he had little time left before seeing God face to face. Yet, in spite of his frailty, he called out a prayer of praise and adoration. Adoration, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, is the act of honoring with admiration and devotion. So his prayer is reverent, acknowledging God for who he is and all he has done and ever will do. It acknowledges God properly as the creator the one with all authority is being beautiful and grand and is being the king of the king's life. During his 40 years as sovereign over Israel, 
David had surely seen some magnificent things, but nothing compared to the majesty of God. Nothing or no one is greater, more wonderful, more glorious, more powerful, or more majestic than God. Have you told him just how much you adore him lately? You see, I don't know that we do that as Christians. We should do it. But do we do it? Do we look upon our lives? Look upon the beauty that surrounds us. It could be a pet that we love dearly. It could be flowers in the garden. It could be the sunshine. It could be interesting cloud formation could be a really cool building, could be our family or other loved ones, friends. It could be even a blade of grass or a little insect that looks interesting. You know, whatever it is that makes us uh, happy or that gives us a little smile, there's always something that we can praise God for, always. But we get so caught up in our personal lives, in us, it's all about us, that we forget to praise God. Francis J. Roberts wrote, Behold, you are in the hollow of my hand, Yes, in the moment that you lift your voice to cry out to me, and when you raise your voice to praise and magnify my name, then shall my glory gather you up. Yes, I shall wrap you in the garments of joy, and my presence shall be your great reward. Francis wrote that from the perspective of Jesus. And I can just imagine him glorying, like taking in our praises. The next one is for the glory of the Lord from Second Chronicles fifth, or sorry, Second Chronicles five, verse thirteen, and it's like the third part of this verse. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever think about this pure gold heavy bronze shiny silver rich drapers sorry rich draperies and tapestries seven and a half years of intense labor these are but a few of the ingredients that went into the building of king solomon's temple which was once located at the present site of the Temple Mount in modern Jerusalem. Solomon's father, King David, had drawn the blueprints to perfection, but had yielded the building of it at God's orders, that according to 1 Chronicles 22.8, to his son. So when it had been completed, Solomon called the elders of Israel to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Zion to Jerusalem. The ark, which was an oblong, oblong box, I know the word, but it's hard to speak it some mornings, made of acacia wood and covered within and without in pure gold. Excuse me. Was the place where God's presence dwelt. So at Solomon's command, the ark was brought to the new temple and placed in the most holy place between the wings of the gold cherubim by the priests. They withdrew, and having done so, the Levites began to offer up prayers of praise in the form of music and song. He is good. His love endures forever. Now it's thought or believed that the Levites, and I'm adding this in, were the group of people where the priests came from. 
And as magnificent as it sounds, it's really what happens next that should awe us the most. Because the temple, scripture tells us, was so filled with God's glory that the priests couldn't complete their duties. They were simply unable to move. Now, I haven't been to too many services where that's happened to me. Um, in fact, I can really only think of one recently where I was in a church. It was a prayer and worship night. And I literally had to go a little bit away from where I was sitting and fall on my knees and just pray. And that feeling is one of the most wonderful, amazing feelings we can ever feel. And, and yet I want to say that it's not about emotion. Our relationship with Christ is not about emotion, but sometimes we can be overcome with emotion. We can be overcome with God's glory. And it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. So that part of the verse of Second Chronicles 5.13, his love endures forever. So <clears throat> you have to understand that that temple that King Solomon built was beyond anything imaginable it was massive it was exquisite it was high on a hill and those celebrating priests may have thought that the temple too would last forever but you know what it did not solomon's temple was destroyed in 556 bc and it was rebuilt by zerubbabel or Zerubbabel, and later Herod. And then it was destroyed for good in AD 7. But although those buildings did not endure forever, God's love does. And God's temple, his dwelling place, is no longer in a building of stone and mortar. God's presence, friends, is no longer in the Ark of the Covenant or in that temple. God's temple is now his people. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. As Peter phrased it, all believers together make up God's abode. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. 1 Peter 2 5. We are temple and priest both. The presence of God dwells with us just as it dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. And quite honestly, it's enough to make us stop everything and stand in awe. If we really understand what that means, it should. Because God's love endures forever, and we are living proof. Leon Morris wrote, Each Christian is a temple in which God dwells. The word is naos, N-A-O-S, referring to the sacred shrine, the sanctuary, not hieron, H-I-E-R-O-N, which includes the entire precincts. This gives a dignity to the whole of life, such as nothing else can do. Wherever we go, we are the bearers of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit the temples in which it pleases God to dwell. 
This must rule out all such conduct as not appropriate to the temple of God. Nothing that would be amiss in God's temple is seemly in the body of the child of God. Think about that. Nothing that would be amiss in God's temple is seemly in the body of the child of God. <clears throat> that means sin, friends. Anything that is not worthy of the Lord. Because trust me, sin and God's glory can't coexist. Not to say that we don't sin, but that's repentance. So here's another one. Psalm 119, verse 171. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. So this is kind of like one of those praise days. We all have them. It's been one of those days. We open our eyes for a thing to discover that the alarm clock had been set for p.m. rather than a.m. I think I've done that once or twice myself. The toast burned rather than turning golden brown. We maybe slip behind the wheel of our car to discover that we're low on gas, too low in fat to make it to our destination, or we run out to catch the bus and we miss it and the next one's an hour behind it. You know, whatever happens. And days like that start off wrong and most often end up worse. And they typically show up at the worst possible time, which for us as human beings causes a day of aggravation, irrational thoughts and negative words that spew from lips that are created to do otherwise. And on days like this, negativity seems to be the natural overflow. But in Psalm 119, the psalmist talks about a very different kind of overflow. The overflow of praise from the lips of a person who has been filled with the word of God. Psalm 119 is rather unusual because it focuses on the word of God, his decrees and laws, rather than the mighty acts of God, as so many of the other psalms do. And the more that the psalmist filled himself with God's word, the more he was inclined to overflow with praise for the God whose word he loved. You see, this idea of overflowing is all about abundance, John 10.10, 10, of God giving more than we can possibly take in. And there will be bad days. That's just a fact of life in a fallen world. But and, and this abundance is not wealth, financial wealth. I want to make that abundantly clear or very, very clear. But when we put ourselves in a position to be filled and overflowed with the word of God, we will react differently. When our days start out bad only to go downhill, or even when they begin in a happy mode, <laughs> excuse me, but take a sudden turn, Prayer and thanksgiving should not only be spoken from our lips, it should spill out. Sometimes we can only learn that principle when God taps us on the shoulder in a moment of discipline to praise rather than spew is a difficult lesson to learn, but one with awesome results for both the giver and the receiver, the receiver capitalized, meaning the Lord. It's natural to be moan and complain over a hard day. 
rather than to lift up praise to God during adverse circumstances. We see that on the server on a daily basis. There's some who every single time they write something, it's negative. And it's not to point out anyone in particular, but it's this mentality of self. Our thoughts, our feelings, our focus is always on ourselves or the things around us, not on God. Do you see what I'm trying to illustrate here, friends? And God's decrees command that we praise him, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.18, even then. Because an absence of praise brings a rebuke from God. But an overflowing of praise brings about a joy which cannot be contained. When life squeezes you, may prayer and praise come out. This is anonymous. Some people complain because God puts thorns on roses, while others praise God for putting roses among the thorns. Now, I'm going to tell you, I haven't arrived at it all. I'll never say that I have. Every day is a learning experience. But when things get so difficult that I don't know what to do, and I've had lots of those or many of those, especially with my husband's health as I go to the Lord. Do I thank him for my husband's illness? No. But I thank him for being here with us in the midst of each and every circumstance. Do I do it all the time? No, I don't. But I'm trying to get there. And the reason for that is when we thank the Lord for every situation in our lives, good or bad, you know, beautiful or ugly, whatever the circumstances are, he changes us. He brings us peace. He brings us comfort. He loves us. And we're not alone. He fills us with his presence. But when we focus on self, you know, my work is bad. My studies are bad. I don't like how I look. I don't like how I talk to this person or the kind of individual I've become or I have no friends or, you know, whatever it is. When we turn it over to Jesus, and we say, Lord, I would like 10 friends, but I have one. Thank you for that friend. Thank you for the blessing of that friendship of the one that I get to see every so often or talk with every so often. Help me to be an encouragement to that person. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to study when so many others don't have that chance. Help me to do a good job in my studies. Help me to do it well. Help me to learn, Lord, to remember and apply it to life. Lord, help me in my career. Help me in my workplace. Help me to be a blessing, Lord, to all those I work with. Help me to accomplish that work the way you want me to be. Thank you for your provision of that work. You see, if we spent our days thanking the Lord for every situation, even if all we can spew out is, thank you for this learning opportunity, Lord. 
our lives change, our attitude changes, and God can come and fill us then with his Holy Spirit presence. But when we fight it and we complain, and all we are is negative, well, that becomes our life. And God can't do what he wants to do in our hearts and lives because we prevent it. Now, all of that, by the way, is from the Lord, I believe. Not my own study. It's my own life experience. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this beautiful morning. It happens to be that it's sunshiny right now for us here. But thank you, Lord, for this day. For whatever it is that you've brought before us this day, whatever time of day it is, whether it's morning or whether it's night, we give it to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would change our attitudes and help us to be thankful for each and every day, for each and every moment of every day, and for your presence with us. Help us to focus on you and not on self. Help us to learn from you. Help us to love others with the love that you have given us. We thank you. We praise you. We glorify your name. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.